quick miles out there today. Nice as it could be across the northeast. Uh, rough seas still uh, from the uh, from the chop. Lots of sunshine. Oh, would you look at Washington, huh? I'm going outside today. Anyway, we're going to have a pretty day. Temperatures will be high pressure. This is just the beginning because another cold front moves in Thursday night. He trigger around the shower activity and drops the temperatures even more. Just gorgeous. I think plane that uh, just that there's a second plane into the direction. second tower. This raises, this has to be deliberate, folks. Well, that would begin to say that, yeah. We just saw on live television as a second plane. Interestingly, interesting enough, just yesterday I received, I think it was just yesterday, uh, a, a bundle of leaflets from your organization in Leesburg warning of terrorist attacks in America here very shortly. And uh, here we have the morning that you're on my program. What's happening in uh, New York at the World Trade Center? Obviously, this is not exactly an accident. No, sir, I don't believe it is. It's not, not, I mean, it's not a coincidence. It, it's obviously that there has to be intention in this thing. Now, first of all, the first suspicion that's going to be on this is Osama bin Laden. That name is going to come up prominently, whether it's suspicion or just suspicion. Certainly. We have a global process. Like, the financial system's coming down. That's always a dangerous thing. Because when the entire system is in being shaken up the way it is now by the financial collapse, political things happen because various people try to intervene and orchestrate events by spectacular interventions which will change, shall we say, get public attention off one thing and put it on another. What? A plane? A, a plane has flown into the Pentagon. They've had an explosion at the Pentagon now. It is confirmed now on several news sources that the Pentagon is experiencing explosions right now. This is, uh, you know, in... <laughs> this, is a very, this is a very systematic operation. If they're, if they're snatching planes, if, if all three of these planes are too rough, the arc in this thing on the Pentagon, to get that kind of thing, to snatch planes like that, means that there's been some kind of either incompetence or a fix on the whole security operation. Because you can't get this kind of thing without a real good on the security side. So somebody in charge of security was not really very effectively in charge. You can't go around snatching planes in a coordinated fashion. Like this, you can't do it. Somebody has to be You don't know, we're going to the period. In which either we do the kinds of things I indicated in summary to you this, today, or else what you're going to have is not a government. You're going to have something like a Nazi regime. What you're going to get with a frustrated Bush administration, if it's determined to prevent itself from being opposed, its will, you're going to get crisis management where members of the special warfare types of the secret government, the secret police teams, and so forth, will set off provocations which will be used to bring about dictatorial powers into motion in the name of crisis management. You will have small wars set off in various parts of the world, which the Bush administration will respond to with crisis management methods of provocation. That's what you'll get. And that's what the problem is. And you have to face that.
eight months before the September 11, 2001 attacks, Lyndon LaRouche forecast that due to the oncoming economic breakdown crisis and the makeup of the incoming Bush administration, the United States was at high risk for a Reichstag fire event. An event that would allow those in power to manage through dictatorial means an economic and social crisis that they were otherwise incompetent to handle. We are presently living in the unbroken wake of that history. Those dictatorial measures established as crisis management in the hours, days, and years following the attack continue. They are expanding under President Barack Obama. The cover-up of the available facts of 9-11 continues, presumably for the benefit and ongoing partnership with the true culprits. The events in New York City and Washington, D.C. were calculated to set into motion an action waiting to be unleashed. The United States and much of the world has lived through the unfolding effects of that day and are now closer than ever to losing the United States as a nation and what that means for civilization. This is a story of the ongoing acts of war against the United States by a foreign power the complicity of its closest allies within the government itself. What follows is living history. It was 1979 in the capital city of Kabul, Afghanistan. The sitting government was faltering to stave off attacks launched by a grouping of increasingly better equipped rebel fighters, the Mujahideen. On Christmas Eve of that year, KGB units seized control of the presidential palace, assassinating the once pro-Moscow president and installing a new president who announced from Soviet territory that the Russian armed forces had been invited to intervene. On December 26, the invitation turned into a full-scale invasion. Soon after, nearly 90,000 Soviet troops were inside Afghanistan, beginning a 10-year war in occupation, which would end only shortly before the Soviet system itself collapsed. During that period, an immense asymmetric warfare capability would be built up in the region. The United States, Great Britain, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and others would each contribute billions to the effort over the course of that 10 years. The funds would go toward building a financial nexus to support the clandestine operations. Banks like the BCCI were established to serve all irregular warfare functions from covert funding of the Mujahideen, the Taliban, and Al-Qaeda, to facilitating the massive British and American arms flows into the region, even to aiding the Pakistani nuclear weapons program. Funds would also enable the buildup of the now trillion dollar dope trade out of a region where prior to 1979, there were virtually no opium plantations or heroin refining. So you have a history of financing covert wars and resistance operations through the use of opium, and it was a British policy. In a relatively short period of time, Opium production in the Golden Triangle region of Southeast Asia was greatly reduced, and suddenly opium production br began to flourish in what was called the Golden Crescent region of uh, Central and South Asia, particularly inside Afghanistan. Between the U.S. official funding and the matching funds that were provided by Saudi Arabia, pretty much dollar for dollar, you still could not account 
for the overall costs of this very extensive military operation using a surrogate Afghan Mujahideen apparatus made up of not only Afghanis, but people recruited from all of the ghettos, the most impoverished areas of the Maghreb region of North Africa. The interest behind the drug and weapons trafficking operation has been known to the region since the 19th century as the British Empire's Opium Wars, or alternately, the Great Game. The modern name put on this operation was the Ark of Crisis. British intelligence asset Dr. Bernard Lewis would coin the phrase and promote the spread of radical Islamic fundamentalism as the basis for the recruitment of the Mujahideen's irregular warfare forces, intending to weaken the adversary, the Soviet Union, from within. This would be adopted by the Carter administration under the guidance of National Security Advisor Zbigniew Brzezinski, who would later gloat of providing the funding to the Mujahideen, saying, we didn't push the Russians to intervene, but we knowingly increased the probability they would. On behalf of British intelligence, Bernard Lewis sold to Brzezinski and the Carter administration the idea that they should promote Islamic fundamentalism running across what they called the arc of crisis or the crescent of crisis policy. And what Bernard Lewis argued was that you could create an entire zone of instability along this southern region of the Soviet Union by promoting Islamic fundamentalism. Brzezinski bragged about the fact that he had gotten President Carter uh, to sign off on an intelligence finding in the early spring of 1979, activating what would become the Islamic fundamentalist uh, Afghan Mujahideen apparatus. It was from this Anglo-American and Saudi-sponsored irregular warfare apparatus that Osama bin Laden was recruited as the trusted intermediary between the Afghan warlords and Saudi intelligence, serving the same function for the British and American interests in the region. Following the war, Osama remained a protected asset. In exchange, he would be given safe haven in London, where he maintained a fabulous private residence in the wealthy suburb of Wembley until the year 2000. The Saudis have renounced any formal ties with bin Laden. However, despite official denials, bin Laden would meet regularly with Saudi intelligence minister Turkey bin Faisal and the CIA throughout the 1980s. And from available information, he would be protected by Saudi GID in cooperation with Pakistani ISI even throughout his house arrest in Abbottabad. Bin Faisal's chief of staff, Ahmed Badib, would later say of bin Laden that he developed strong relations with the Saudi intelligence and with our embassy in Pakistan. We were happy with him. He was our man. He was doing all what we asked him. Americans are asking, who attacked our country? The evidence we have gathered all points to a collection of loosely affiliated terrorist organizations known as Al-Qaeda. This group and its leader, a person named Osama bin Laden, are linked to many other organizations in different countries, including the Egyptian Islamic Jihad. Once the Soviet forces retreated from Afghanistan, the Anglo-American sponsored Mujahideen, together with their extensive drug and arms trafficking apparatus, were dumped on the world as a legion of special forces trained mercenaries for hire. A nearly $1 trillion drug and arms trade that was built up over the course of the war 
had created an underground economy engulfing much of the former Soviet Union and Central Asia. But the flow of hard money from the drug and arms trade was increasingly what the international banking system relied on for capital. By the mid-1990s, it was known and accepted that the biggest banks on Wall Street and in London were laundering billions of dollars of illegal drug money every year simply as a matter of policy. The fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet system began a new era in world affairs. It was a time that could have been defined by the Strategic Defense Initiative, the East-West economic reconstruction proffered through circles in the Reagan administration by Lyndon LaRouche, but became a turn toward a new Roman Empire, the system of globalization inaugurated through the partnership of British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, President George H.W. Bush, and French President Francois Mitterrand. Germany and continental Europe were bound under the Euro system. The former Soviet economy was turned into a raw materials exporter. State assets were sold for scrap. The territory itself was cannibalized to maintain what the British called a balance of power. Without the threat of the Cold War, the United States gave up even the pretense to a productive economy. Military production itself was transformed under the revolution in military affairs, entrusting national defense to private military mercenary forces and shifting to so-called smart weaponry. At this time, a global partnership was rekindled and the Bush senior administration revived the treasonous Anglo-American special relationship with the stated purpose of creating a Pax Americana. That doomed system of globalization depended on the stepwise ratcheting down of production, moving high-paying, high-skilled U.S. jobs overseas, decreasing standards of living, while increasing nominal values in the financial sector. With the sequential crashing of fictitious asset bubbles, the telecommunications bubble, the dot-com bubble, and soon the housing bubble, new means were required to hold that system together. Nothing less than a veritable fascist dictatorship over the nation wielding the greatest military force and the greatest economic force would make a suitable partner in securing that globalized system. But it required a casus belli. In early January of 2001, before the inauguration of George W. Bush as president, I warned that the general nature of the catastrophe would be that the U.S. economy these would be a failure. The policies of, of Bush would be a total failure. We were headed into a downslide, which in fact has happened all throughout this period. And the thing we had to fear from inside the U.S. government, that someone would set off a form of terrorist incident within the year which would shock the, the nation into submission. Now certain facts are not known and I shall, I shall not say what I know now, but I shall say that I do know beyond doubt that 9-11 was an inside job. But whose end we will not see. It is a story of a new world that became a friend and liberator of as a second plane flew into the South Tower, President Bush was informed at Booker Elementary School that the United States was under attack. Vice President Cheney was ushered into an underground bunker as procedure in the continuity of government plan. In the first meeting of the Bush cabinet in the hours that followed, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld and Deputy Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz 
would encourage Bush not to limit the response to the attacks, but to think more broadly of an invasion of Iraq, Afghanistan, Sudan, Libya, and Iran. In the next 24 hours, all flights in U.S. airspace were grounded, yet a private aircraft landed in Washington, D.C., carrying the head of the British Secret Intelligence Service, MI6, and the Deputy Chief of Britain's Domestic Intelligence Service, MI5. Later, CIA Director George Tenet would reflect, saying, I still don't know how they got flight clearance into the country. By the end of the week, another private flight would leave the country, this one carrying approximately 140 Saudi Arabian citizens, including 24 members of the Bin Laden family, before the FBI could question any of them. The search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. I appreciate so very much the members of Congress. Within days, the evidence mounted that the attacks on Washington and New York were being used to usher in fundamental changes to the United States Constitution. A presidential decree giving the CIA the authority to assassinate high value targets in Al Qaeda and the authority to set up secret detention and interrogation sites was put into place. The Congress signed into law the authorization for the use of military force, overriding the War Powers Resolution, and giving the President the far-reaching authority to use any means he deemed necessary and proper in the interests of national security. Within the immediate days, really hours, after the 9-11 attacks on New York and Washington, uh, there were emergency meetings of the uh, administration uh, in which the decision was made to go to war on the basis of the 9-11 attacks. And right from the very outset, there were people in the administration who wanted to focus their attention on Iraq rather than even Afghanistan. And there was an attempt to get Congress, in the panic of the moment, to give broad war-making powers to the Bush administration. As this was happening, the financial markets in New York reopened, but only after the Federal Reserve had pumped $57 billion into the system over the course of the week. At that time, Lyndon LaRouche warned, do not use terrorism for a financial bailout. By early October, the United States had declared war on Afghanistan. U.S. and United Kingdom special armed forces and airstrike forces were deployed with NATO and fully engaged in irregular warfare against what the British, the United States, and Saudi Arabia had fostered into existence so recently. Too soon, what many Americans had seen as their guaranteed rights as citizens were being fast eroded. Whatever trust was invested in the government was turned to deep pessimism, as was any idea that justice was being served for the attacks against America. By 2002, it was clear, particularly in military circles, that an additional sacrifice would be demanded of young men and women to no purpose this time in Iraq. Foreign sympathy for the attacks on the United States waned just as quickly. U.S. foreign policy turned far away from the doctrine that we do not go abroad in search of monsters to destroy and toward what can only be called British-modeled neo-imperialism. We are all internationalists now, whether we like it or not. We cannot refuse to participate in global markets if we want to prosper. We cannot ignore new political ideas in other countries if we want to innovate. 
we cannot turn our backs on conflicts and the violation of human rights within other countries if we want still to be secure. On the eve of a new millennium, we are now in a new world. We need new rules for international cooperation and new ways of organizing our international institutions. America has no truer friend than Great Britain. Once again, we are joined together in a great cause. So honored the British Prime Minister has crossed an ocean to show his unity with America. Thank you for coming, friend. There was a British geostrategic objective here which had everything to do with drawing the United States into a war in which the U.S. would be seen as the new great imperial power and as the enemy of the entire Arab and Islamic world. There's all kinds of speculation that George W. Bush wanted to avenge the fact that Saddam Hussein had an assassination plot out against his father there were all kinds of arguments that this was really just all about oil geopolitics and the West, the Anglo-Americans, wanting to gain control over the oil flows coming out of Iraq. But uh, the reality is a lot deeper and a lot darker than that. And if you don't understand the fundamental hatred of the United States in the minds of leading circles within the British oligarchy, going all the way back to the time of the American Revolution, then you miss some of the most fundamental aspects of why the United States was dragged by its nose into this Iraq fiasco. As early as March 2002, there had already been an agreement between members of the Bush administration and Prime Minister Tony Blair that the next target for the global war on terrorism would be regime change in Iraq. By July, the Downing Street Memorandum made clear that the intelligence and the facts were being fixed around the policy. The lies from Vice President Dick Cheney and Tony Blair were obscene and continued up until the March 19th invasion. It was said that Saddam had long-standing ties to Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, that the entire operation would take weeks, it would be a cakewalk, and the United States would be welcomed as liberators. And finally, that Saddam Hussein had stockpiles of weapons of mass destruction and a nuclear weapons program, claims based on the intelligence that the government of Niger had sold 500 tons of yellow cake uranium to Iraq. The documents backing the claim were blatant forgeries, and the existence of weapons of mass destruction never was or ever could be verified. And what, is, uh, what is that charge? Well, first of all, as you know, that uh, <clears throat> uh, Cheney, uh, on receipt of a report of a uh, process out of the Rome Embassy of the Niger uh, government, uh, was investigating a, a charge that Yellow Cake was being solicited for assistance in a uranium weapons program in Iraq. And uh, Cheney had an investigation of this done and found out shortly that uh, in February of 2002 that the whole thing was a hoax cooked up by some fellow inside the Rome Embassy in particular. But nonetheless, uh, the Yellow Cake the thing was pushed and on the same day, the office of the British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, uh, issued a dossier based on this false information. Subsequently, Mr. Cheney, in uh, times when the uh, question of the Iraq war was being heavily debated, pushed this yellow cake story consciously knowing uh, that he'd received information that it was a hoax. And uh, was used, particularly at a time that the Congress was very reluctant to give its acquiescence to of Iraq war, and the yellow cake story, the, the charge that uh, 
Iraq was about to have uh, mass production of nuclear weapons pushed a number of senators over the edge. Now we have Congressman Waxman in the past year has been sent out two memos. By winter of 2003, the anti-war demonstrations had grown immense. The largest protests in human history took place February 15th in cities around the world. At the United Nations, leaders representing billions of citizens in Asia, Africa, Europe, and South America opposed the war. And the head weapons inspector failed to uncover WMD stockpiles corroborating the US and UK justification to go to war. This stained the operation as a war of aggression, which can only be dealt with by bringing charges of war crimes against its authors. So we've come to a point that the war is still not prevented. But we have seen the world move from a point of pessimism about an inevitable war to a strong conviction, even from leaders of nations who had shown cowardice or wavering beforehand, who are now determined on behalf of the human race as a whole, this war shall not happen. Great injustices prevail. Unnecessary great wars happen, repeatedly. But nonetheless, sooner or later, again and again, the people realize they cannot be fooled all of the time. The invasion of Iraq took place at virtually the same time the war itself was being exposed as a fraud. As the Iraq campaign began, Lyndon LaRouche, the most outspoken American politician at that time, was brought onto BBC radio with the understanding that he would sound the alarm. Shortly after the invasion began, there was a surge from whistleblowers in the United States and Great Britain who were bold enough to risk their careers and their lives to expose the fraud of the war. Soon after the invasion began, uh, circles working through the British Broadcasting Corporation contacted Lyndon LaRouche and asked him to do a series of interviews in which the main subject was the Iraq War, the uh, fraud and lies that led into it, and LaRouche's by then very public call for the impeachment of Vice President Dick Cheney. During the exact same time frame, Dr. David Kelly, uh, a leading uh, British defense scientist who had been one of the weapons inspectors inside Iraq uh, prior to the invasion, um, went to some of his own contacts at the upper echelons of BBC and tipped them off anonymously to the fact that the dossiers that had been produced by Tony Blair and his staff at 10 Downing Street, people like Alistair Campbell uh, and others, uh, had been, as he put it, sexed up. He was called before the British Parliament. Uh, he was given all kinds of threats. And uh, under these circumstances, soon afterwards, uh, his body was found and uh, it was declared to have been a suicide. But all of the evidence, in fact, pointed to a sophisticated murder by British intelligence. The David Kelly case made clear the lengths the British establishment was willing to go to execute the war. The legal attacks against Lyndon LaRouche during that time up to the present day are part of the exact same operation to eradicate adversaries, quieting opposition on the grounds of protecting state secrets or defending national security. All of this was justified by the Anglo-American launching of a new kind of war, the Global War on Terrorism, begun ostensibly to prosecute those who attacked the United States on September 11, 2001. Yet in the course of that war, 
in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in the extension of wartime operations to neighboring countries, the illegal detentions, torture, the spying, wiretapping, and presidential signing statements, there was always one glaring omission. Not because the evidence didn't exist, but because fear overshadowed the truth of what was the most unambiguous trail of logistical support for the acts of war carried out against the United States on September 11th. Hazmi and Al Midarm went to Al Hazmi and Al Midarm community with the Harkin Police. Do you play any role in helping them get adjusted? Do you in any way help them? No. No one ever suggested to me that I provide the hijackers with assistance. When they were trying to get when the they apartment, they were not able to pay the security. But you were able to. But you were able to. You were able to. Yes. I made the security deposits in that apartment. No, I disagree very much with the way pursued by them in that attack. When you met Hazmi and Midar in the... You had gone to the Saudi embassy in Los Angeles and from them that you should be helping the two individuals in question. What do you think of all this? What do you think of all this? What do you think about the allegations that you helped support individuals responsible for these attacks? For these attacks. Did they describe me as a Saudi spy? That hurts me very much. When the initial Congressional Joint Committee to investigate the events of 9-11 was convened, certain facts stood out, including a memo in mid-2002 from the CIA stating that there is incontrovertible evidence that there is support for these terrorists within the Saudi government. Former Senator from Florida and head of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Bob Graham, and senior Senator from Alabama, Richard Shelby, pulled together the case of the Saudi royal family support for two of the known terrorists, Nawaf al-Hazmi and Khalid al-Midar. As the committee concluded their initial report in December 2002 and prepared to publish their findings, they ran up against immense opposition. When the committee report reached the president's desk, it was decided that the 28 pages dealing with the Saudi role in the attacks would be removed and classified. When members of the initial inquiry, like Senators Graham and Shelby, were reconvened as part of the official 9-11 commission, they tried to review the material in the 28 pages, but they were prohibited from looking back at their own research. Senator Shelby, who was the vice chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee and who was a Republican, reread those pages shortly after they were classified, and I also reread them. Independently, we both came to the same assessment that 95% of the material that had been classified could have been released to the public. It did not represent concealment of national secrets or of sources and methods by which information is obtained. My own personal conclusion was that the evidence of official Saudi support for at least two of the terrorists in San Diego was, as one CIA agent said, incontrovertible. That led us to another question. Why would the Saudis have provided that level of assistance to two of the 19 hijackers and not the other 17? There wasn't an adequate attempt to answer that question. What came to light in the course of the investigation demonstrated decisively that the Saudi royal family and Saudi ambassador to the United States, Prince Bandar bin Sultan, were directly involved in the financing of at least two of the 9-11 hijackers through established Saudi intelligence assets on the West Coast, Omar al-Bayoumi and Osama Basnan. What happened is the following. Around New Year's, of 2000, two Saudi nationals arrived at uh, Los Angeles International Airport and they were met there near the airport by two known agents of Saudi intelligence. One of the agents was named 
uh, Osama Basnan, and the other was Omar al-Bayoumi. Uh, both of these people were on the Saudi government payroll. So Basnan and al-Bayoumi picked up the two future 9-11 terrorists, brought them down to San Diego, arranged for them to get housing, provided funding for them as they settled in to Southern California, got them social security ID cards, and ultimately paid for the two men to travel to Florida to enroll in flight training school, which would be part of the cover for the 9-11 operation. Now, where did the money come from that Basnan and al-Bayoumi used to finance the setting in place of at least two of the 9-11 hijackers. Now, if you tell me that building this whole country and spending 350 billion out of 400 billion, that we had a misused or get corrupted with 50 billion, I'll tell you yes, but I'll take that any time. I mean, I see every time all the scandals here or in England or in Europe. What I'm trying to tell you is, so what? We did not invent uh, corruption. Over the course of four years, between $51,000 and $73,000 in checks and cashier's checks would be delivered from Prince Bandar and his wife, Princess Haifa bin Faisal, the daughter of then Saudi intelligence minister Turkey bin Faisal, to Bayoumi and Basnan, then living in the San Diego area. The money deposited into Bayoumi's San Diego account was sent from the wife of Osama Basnan, Majeda Dwaikit, to Al Bayoumi's wife, Manal Bajara. However, the initial transfer to Basnan's wife, made by Princess Haifa bin Faisal, originated from the bank account of Saudi Ambassador Prince Bandar bin Sultan at Riggs National Bank in Washington, D.C. So we're not talking about secondary or incidental connections here into the Saudi royal family and the Saudi government. Uh, these connections don't go any higher. The world has been living under a system which is the 9-11 system, which already existed, as I warned, at the beginning of 2001, before President George W. Bush was inaugurated for the first time, where I said, the world system has reached a point that a onrushing collapse of the system is now in process. And I said then the danger is that something like this will occur under present trends in the United States, and it did occur. And it was called 9-11. Now, without going into the details of how, what we know and what we don't know about how 9-11 was orchestrated, we know that the, orchest the only me means by which this kind of thing is orchestrated is found in one location, in a financial complex which is centered in the identity of the BAE. Okay. Now that's the mystery of 9-11. On June 6, 2007, the BBC reported on a major scandal involving British arms giant BAE Systems and Saudi Ambassador Prince Bandar. Over the course of 22 years, Prince Bandar had received more than $2 billion in bribes and kickbacks deposited into his bank account at Riggs National Bank in Washington, D.C. for his role in brokering the Saudi-British oil for arms deal Al Yamama, or in Arabic, the Dove. Great Britain's serious fraud office had been conducting a probe of the multi-billion dollar deal for more than a decade. In December 2006, that investigation was shut down by Tony Blair's Attorney General, David Goldsmith, just as the case was heating up and the United States was opening a Justice Department probe into the same affair. The serious fraud office investigation was shut down on the grounds that it was against the interests of national security to pursue the case and that it would hurt both an important economic and geostrategic relationship with the Saudi Kingdom. A 
the end of both the Soviet-Afghan and Iran-Iraq wars, Saudi Arabia prepared in the mid-1980s to purchase aircraft and other military hardware to better outfit their air force. In the United States, any such purchase by the Saudis would require congressional approval. In Britain, under the Defense Export Service Organization, no parliamentary approval was needed. In 1985, Prince Bandar bin Sultan, diplomat to Great Britain, brokered the purchase of 48 Tornado IDS combat fighters and 30 Hawk trainers through British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. The two were so trusting in the exchange that the deal was sealed with a simple handshake. The estimated value of the hardware delivered to the Saudis from BAE was approximately $40 billion not counting an approximate 40% markup on the equipment to provide for bribes and official kickbacks for the relevant parties involved, such as Prince Bandar. In exchange, the British were to receive one super tanker of oil every day, approximately 600,000 barrels of oil per day for the entire life of the Al Yamama contracts, which are still intact to this day. That oil, costing the Saudis roughly $5 a barrel to pump out of the ground, would be sold on the international spot market through British Petroleum and Royal Dutch Shell at market value. By 2007, over the 22-year course of the contract, the most modest estimates for the cumulative value of the oil was approximately $160 billion. The cumulative value of the arms? $80 billion. That left somewhere between 80 to $100 billion unaccounted for. Uh, to put it very mildly, uh, the numbers didn't add up. Uh, from the Saudi standpoint, it was a pretty good deal because the oil that they provided over a period from 1985 through 2007, uh, which was when EIR uh, did its study, the total cost was under $25 billion. So the Saudis got $40 billion in military equipment and services, $20 billion in bribes and kickbacks, and the total cost from their standpoint was $25 billion in crude oil. So in other words, somewhere between $80 and $100 billion was unaccounted for and in fact had been set up in offshore bank accounts to function as one of the biggest unregulated covert intelligence funds that had ever been assembled. The $100 billion price tag on the BAE Alyamama slush fund is the most modest estimate. Some have recently suggested the actual value of the fund is an order of magnitude larger. But beyond estimates or speculations, the fund served a specific purpose. A friend of Prince Bandar's from his time in the Royal Air Force College Cranwell in England, William Simpson, wrote in his authorized biography of the prince that although Al Yamama constitutes a highly unconventional way of doing business, its lucrative spin offs are the byproduct of a wholly political objective a Saudi political objective and a British political objective. Al Yamama is first and foremost a political contract. Al Yamama money can be found in the clandestine purchase of Russian ordnance used in the expulsion of Gaddafi's troops from Chad. It can also be traced to arms bought from Egypt and other countries and sent to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan fighting the Soviet occupying forces. For four years prior to the 9-11 attacks, tens of thousands of dollars were funneled to the intelligence assets responsible for the two 9-11 hijackers on the west coast. The money to sponsor both the hijackers and their handlers originated from the same Riggs National Bank account where billions of dollars in kickbacks were being delivered to U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Prince Bandar bin Sultan.
from the available evidence, it is known that the logistics to run 9-11 were provided through the BAE Al Yamama Slush Fund, a British-Saudi political agreement. Presently, the Al Yamama Slush Fund represents the biggest pool of clandestine cash in history. It is protected under Her Majesty's Official Secrets Act and buried in the closely guarded finances of the City of London and offshore unregulated financial havens under British dominion. If you open up the Pandora's box, if you even begin to look at the implications of the role of Prince Bandar in financing two of the 19 hijackers, then the unavoidable question that must come out is the entire Al Yamama operation, which was from its outset a combined British Saudi capability that represents hundreds of billions of dollars in covert funds to carry out all kinds of asymmetric warfare operations around the globe. And to the extent that that fund still remains intact to this moment, there are grave dangers and grave implications that have yet to be fully explored because no government agency has fully taken up the investigation. Eight months before the 9-11 attacks, Lyndon LaRouche warned that as a response to the economic conditions, the incoming administration would attempt a dictatorial coup to control the situation through crisis management. To this day, the United States president has continued this legacy of the post-9-11 presidency, governing through crisis management and executive decrees, seizing on the broad powers assumed in a time of emergency. Two foreign governments have been implicated in an act of war against the United States, and two administrations have been complicit in covering that up. In turn, under the continuing cover-up of the available facts of the 9-11 attacks, Americans have been complicit in perpetrating imperial warfare against other nations, Tens of trillions of dollars have been taken out of the nation's coffers for a global bailout, and the geopolitical and financial ties with those who abetted in that act of war against the United States have only strengthened. Good evening. Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation which It has been 10 years since the attacks were made. Who benefit? <laughs> 